Hi, and welcome to the Heart Leader Podcast, where heart and mind align. I'm your host, Amber, and today I am just over the moon thrilled to introduce a new team member to the Suivera family. This is Linda Levette, and she is our executive director of education. She has so kindly stepped in and really taken over the helm of all of the amazing education and resources that freely flow through everything you see in Suivera and even through the Heart Leader Toolbox. So this woman who comes to us with 45 years plus in the education industry from teaching in all primary, middle, high schools, college level. She really has devoted her life, her heart, and her skill set to understanding how to teach everyone in every capacity. She's focused on autism and really understanding how individuals across the board soak in information. And she's sharing that depth and breadth of knowledge with us and has come on board as an amazing light and heart leader for us in an area where we really are seeking to expand and grow. So who better to have on as we're focusing on creativity than someone who's sparking our own internal creative light? So Linda, really, really, you have made us a better organization from the day you landed and helped us understand ways that we could grow and reach people. And, you know, things make sense to us, right? Austin and I, we were just working away, doing our thing, and they made such sense to us. And then you came in like this breath of fresh air and started going, but what about this? And some people look at things this way, and you could potentially consider it from this angle and make it slightly better. And not once did you ever hesitate to tell us that. You just came in and we're like, and this, and this. Where does that spark in you come from? That amazing ability to see things from so many different angles and say, okay, what if you looked at it this way? instead of that way? What have you looked at a circle instead of a square or these straight lines that you've been doing? Help help us understand where this creative genius comes from in you. Well, first of all, go back to saying how coming with a breath of fresh air and telling somebody else what to do, it's not usually accepted that way. So it's because of the graciousness of you and Austin that I've had a chance to do something I've kind of wanted to do my whole life, which is um, share the perspective that I have about how people can learn and how you can encompass everybody in a learning process without somebody telling me that they're not interested. So working with you guys has just been like a dream come true. So um, to answer your question is, is in my um, professional career, I had a chance to start with really young kids. And I had a chance to work with people that do not learn easily. Most of my degrees are in special education, which doesn't mean that everybody who is identified or isn't identified needs special help. But when you start with the youngest kids and then you move all the way up to the college level, you begin to see why people haven't learned something. Somewhere along the line, they got lost or something got left out or they lost their confidence. And so the creative spark in me is always about how to pick up the stragglers, especially with something like Suivera, where you want everybody to be part of the community and to be able to go in and say, let's just make it a little easier or let's try it this way so everybody can feel comfortable or everybody can jump in. And for me, it's just an opportunity that I couldn't imagine I'd be lucky enough to find. Well, we feel lucky to have you. Because it is very easy to get stuck in your lane, right? Right. And it's not intentional. It's just, you know, we all pick up these little ways of doing things. And so to have someone who is secure enough in themselves, that, that in itself takes education and growth. 
So okay, when you find somebody that's also secure enough in themselves that they're ready to take suggestions, then that's where things work out. Yes. So how did you get to that point within yourself? You brought with you classes that you had been creating throughout your years in teaching. Can we talk a little bit about this plethora of classes that you yourself had been creating and practicing on yourself in the area of self-love and self-growth and all of those avenues. Not only are you active in looking outward, which is how we actually came to know you, is you came in looking at some of our classes, but you created your own so that you could share the knowledge that you had gained. So let's talk about some of those. Okay. What? Let's start with the elemental EQ. Okay. So um, as I was growing up in teaching and working in my career in public schools and all the way through college, and mostly in life, I looked at people and the question I always thought are, why are some people happy? and other people's aren't. Why are some people successful and other people aren't? And trying to identify the variable that would make me better as a professional and better as a person to think, what's this magic that some people are just simply more successful? So when you're a teacher, you get programmed into curriculum. You get programmed into having to teach a specific subject. But when you start looking at it's not working or, wow, these these kids or young adults are successful but they're not happy or you look at your own personal life and you think maybe what we're teaching isn't the most important thing maybe there's a subset that we're missing here about confidence about curiosity about creativity about laughter about humor about um, resiliency about willing to do a redo and you know my whole life wasn't perfect i had a lot of ups and downs that that continue to go on all the time and I began to focus less on curriculum and more on what do I think people really need to know. And that's where I started looking at, at that concept, which is called emotional intelligence, which is a much broader term for a lot of things. But the happiness quotient, the heart love quotient, the ability to keep picking yourself up and going forward quotient. And so I started focusing on that. And over a long period of time, I just... I'm a voracious learner. I'd go listen to anybody and, and listen to their perspective, not to criticize it, but just to add it into the other perspectives. And I was lucky enough to go to a lot of different people, a lot of different classes, lots of different places, and begin to consolidate it myself into something that I felt anybody could learn. And so when I came up with my first little program, it was something of I thought everybody needed to know, but mostly I wrote it for your average, maybe special needs person or somebody that doesn't know anything. So how do you make it as simple as possible so a three-year-old or a 93-year-old could still get the same information with the same amount of, of effort and, and then act upon it? And that's where I created my first program. And I thought, well, I don't really have a market for it, but I gave it away to one person a day, like for three years and thought, this, this is fun. I kind of went from there. This episode of the Heart Leader Podcast was brought to you by Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas is one of the nation's leading boutique search and interim resources firms and has been recognized as a leader in identifying and providing access to top talent for clients since 1984. Whether it's a company preparing to go to the next level or a candidate looking for better opportunities, Stephen Douglas keeps the focus on the needs of the people they serve. They specialize in connecting the right talent to a company's needs while also understanding what the market demands. To learn more about this amazing organization, visit them at stephendouglas.com. That's spectacular. Were you a student of your own material? Oh, absolutely. Don't you think that you have to always say you teach what you need to know? But, but I think what actually happens is when you have that antenna of I need to know or I want to know or I'm open to receive that idea that the teacher will show up. When you're looking for something, um, it starts showing up. It just takes your own willingness to start applying it in your own life and maybe 
bouncing it off other things or looking at a different perspective and be curious enough to keep going forward. I'm never afraid to say, well, that doesn't work for me, but, and then go with the but. Yes. And I would say that there's also that tipping point that we hit too, because as you said, being a voracious learner, mm -hmm. there's this tipping point of gathering all this knowledge, mm -hmm. all this information. And that's great, but we're not libraries, right? We don't just collect information and store it in our memories or in our bodies. We have to find a way to convert it from knowing it, learning it, having that. Then how do we apply it? How do we embody all that we've come to have acquired and know so that it actually becomes part of who we are? And is now a character trait or an actual, because we've taken the time, we've consumed it. Now, what is that tipping point to it becoming part of our habit pattern, part of our character trait, part of who we actually are? And that's some of the things that we talk about when we have our team meetings. Like, how can we create this pathway that sets the foundation? that gets them the information, but then tips it over that tipping point to where it's not just information. information. This is applicable to them and their life. Well, in, in education, when you're planning something, you have the introductory stage, then you have the practice stage, and then you have the mastery stage. But so much of life, we, especially in school, we learn things that we then don't apply. And then you actually don't actually know them, whether you got an A in biology, does it mean that if you don't if you utilize it, you actually apply it? And we do that in, in structured education, and then we do that in life. And so those of us who are always trying to be on a journey of being a better person or exploring the things we need to know, it's so nice to try to learn something and then give it a shot, give it a go and see, is this really working for me? Because my perspective on, on learning is if you don't mis make mistakes, you haven't learned anything because a mistake is one of life's best lessons. And that's not something you learn in school, but you do learn it in life. And you think, well, now I have a good question and I can go ask or I can go try harder or I can go look something up or, you know, adjust, monitor and adjust in my personal life and in my, my journey, my spiritual journey, as well as my biology class. Yeah. And you had brought forward many good points, but another is keeping the education system open right. so as someone does go and adapts any tool we provide to fit them that they have the ability to come back and ask right. questions after right because if a window closes you have this course for this duration of time and that's it after that we're no longer available to you well that's not going to help someone who is a, literally applying this in their life because life changes, and if they keep going back to these tools and applying them the way that we've asked them to apply them, then they're going to have a question. And that's what's interesting that's going to happen in structured education as well as the online education and the education that many people are getting now is by the time you have the question, the class is often over. The professor's already gone. You know, you've lost the textbook, and you're thinking, well, now what? Because now I'm ready to learn because I tried to utilize these things and, and I'm ready to, to, to apply stuff and I don't have anybody to help me. So when online education or the kind of short course classes that, that we're offering now that you own and you have access to and you can stop in the middle of them, you can apply so much easier and go back and think, oh, I get that now. But the idea of having it end and go away before you've even half applied or mastered any of the material is, is not how we're going to ever move forward in a, in a topic or in a curriculum. And I feel like that's just such an amazing perspective to come at that with. Because if you look at the training that those who create online content are given, it's time it out after a certain period of time, you know, so you're taught as you're creating content to time it out. So the message is different right. than it is from the consumer side of it, which is, 
no, I need time to actually utilize this to, if my goal is to actually make this part of my life, then I need to live it for a little while to take it step by step and incorporate it. That's one of the fun first conversations that we had is I do take a lot of classes online, especially because I've been home a lot like most people have. And it would not be my style of learning, but I take them and maybe I'm not interested. Once I get started, I think I'm not that interested. And I stop it. And then I think, well, I paid a lot of money for that or a little about of money, or I get the time to readjust or it comes back in my thought and awareness. And I go back and boy, if it's not there, or I can't remember how to find it, or um, I can't access it again, doesn't make me outrage it makes me outraged I don't think well that's too bad you you didn't read the fine print that you only had had 30 days or something when I know I can go back when the time is ready it's like I can have a delightful little treasure chest to look up in or your own personal library but your personal library doesn't have to be inside of you it's stored somewhere where you can access again and so there are all these little things that you're bringing to the table to breathe life into a living system Mm -hmm. that can become a really great place to go. And another thing that we've been talking about is make it a multiple pathway approach, but all centered in a heart. And you even talk about creative. This goes to that creative aspect of what we're talking about. You drew a picture. Can you describe the, like, We're sitting here at the side of the meeting. We're all talking about the technical and the technology side of it and all the things that we have in motion. And meanwhile, you're over here with a piece of paper drawing things. Can you express what you drew and why you drew what you drew? I think um, that people have had the idea of learning styles or multiple kinds of intelligence as something that was kind of popular a while ago, and then it kind of hit the skids. People said, that's just ridiculous. But it isn't ridiculous. We all learn in completely different ways. And I'm much better with the visualization of something. And because I've worked with a lot of people that have learning issues, a lot of people have learning issues in school because they're visual learners or they're hands-on learners. And most of all, they need the whole picture first. I'm not well behaved enough to just follow along, you know, page by page, idea by idea. I need the whole picture of a program or a concept first, not only in a visual picture, but in a mental and emotional picture. Where are we going? What do we want to do? How do you want to do it? So when people are talking, I'm trying to get the big picture, both visually and, and intellectually, to see the end so we can make the pathway easier. And so I guess I just started seeing that other people maybe learn learn like me and the visualization of a heart and people entering it from different pathways at the level where they're at, when they want to, for as long as they need to, in a way that works for them. That kind of seems what we're trying to do here. So I was delighted when, when you guys accepted that, that as a possible idea. It's an amazing idea. And that visual representation will end up on our website. And so what you had done is, yes, everything that we're doing is about leading from the heart, right? Leading a life of love from the heart and how that aligns with the mind, but it isn't ruled by the mind, right? So kind of reversing our flow Mm -hmm. instead of letting this dominate us and determine when we can love. It's the other way. We're always loving. And the brain is a wonderful tool for all of that. And so you drew this magnificent image that showed how all those pathways are possible. And then we talked about, well, it's kind of like drawing a map for a museum, right? Enter wherever you're most interested. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you can't take the rest of the journey. Because once you see that exhibit and you feel like you've really got that, then you can go to see the others and they kind of all build upon the other. Well, it's a concept, you know, that's the subset of what we're talking about today is, is you have to be curious about anything to learn anything. And I find it at hard when people don't understand that is you can't just be talked at in any capacity. You have to have a question. 
and a question requires a pause. Usually something happens and then you pause that all of a sudden you start being curious. And if you're allowed to be curious and there isn't um, an end of the pathway that you don't get to continue to go someplace else, which is what school is like most of the time, and you're curious, then you can can make a detour or you can all of a sudden dig deeper into something that you like to do. And so the idea of making curiosity a huge part of, of a learning experience to me then opens up creativity. When people are curious, then they're going to be more creative about how they're going to find their solutions and far less passive. And to be an a learner, an avid learner, and actually actualize information, you have to be passionate. You have to be asking questions. You have to be willing to, to raise the bar to learn more or to, to question what you learned and maybe apply something else. And so I'm pretty excited about mixing curiosity into the creative mix of what we're trying to do. And the opportunity to ask as many questions as you want Mm -hmm. we are all about question everything that's right. it's actually an amazing asset because if you're not if you have a question and you're not asking it then you're never going to move forward from that point you think how stymied you get when you have a question and you keep wanting to interrupt somebody and you just you're not even listening to anything else they say because that question has taken over everything and then if you're not given an opportunity to ask it you just kind of dissipate and your energy flows down and maybe you get back into the conversation or the lecture later but that that spark of of oh tell me more about this is is what what we're trying to do in, in learning learn what we need to know not what somebody else thinks we should know at that point there might be an end result or an end game but how you get there is very circuitous and everybody has their their own route and circling around and coming back and asking the questions and redoing 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 is the ad the advantage of what we're offering now with online classes and especially if you own them all and somebody will answer your questions yeah so agreed and then joy Making it fun. Right. Instead of, as you brought up, being talked at. Mm -hmm. How about being talked with? Mm -hmm. And that presents an interesting approach when we're talking about right. online learning. Right. But it's not impossible. And that's the barrier that we're seeking to actually kind of reach out and cross. Because we can still connect with the people that are in our community like this. This is a medium to connect right. with people in the community and not talk at them, but still talk with them. What do you desire us to talk about? Even on these podcasts, what courses are you looking for? What is it that would best be in service of you? Then we're talking with you right. and guiding you and not talking at you with what we think you want to know. Because at the end of the day, we're here to be in service of the community. We are one community bringing each other together. So to have someone at the helm of the education like you, who understands that and isn't going to talk at people, but bring them together for mutual benefit and learning, that for us was a major win. We, when you when you look back at teachers over or any kind of instructor, but teacher in general over time, they were expected to be seers. Maybe they were people that were respected and looked forward to, and people were supposed to honor what they say. And as a teacher, I thought, wait a second, I don't think I'm that big of an expert on anything. And so a a good teacher has a, something that they want to share, but it has to be be you have to be able to be offering it to people who want to learn it, but at the level and at the speed and at the um, angle that they want to learn it. And then all of a sudden, you rise to the equation. When I started teaching, I, when I was teaching little kids, 
I realized after a few years, nobody was the least bit interested in anything that I was teaching. We're talking about primary school. And when I had my, my own children who were just like, I'm never going to school again, you realize they hated it. And I'm taking them somewhere that somebody's doing just what I'm doing. And I just flipped over my whole idea of what you need to know. And I began to really waiting until the children showed up in my classroom and then teaching them. I understand the standards and things and how you weave that in. What they were very interested in that was current or that was part of their lifestyle or that came in from something that 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 was going to elicit the passion in them. And then I rose to the occasion of having to go find the answers. And before the internet, this was not easy. But even now, when somebody asks you a question and you have a vague idea, that's when your creativity and your curiosity fires up as a teacher, I want to ask that question. I want I want to ask it of myself. I want to go find out more. I want to make sure I can come back and, and share that information with my team or my students or the people that are, are taking my class because that's learning. It's active. Learning is an active process, not a passive process. And even though online seems very passive, it doesn't have to be. And the way that you're setting up your classes here, it's so interactive and you provide so many different um, ways to segue into the same ideas. The learner is far more in charge than the teacher. And that's kind of my point. A teacher may be a figurehead, but it's the learner that's going to draw the information from a well-designed class or a, a teacher who understands the value of the information that they want to share with others. That's magnificent. Now, you're designing a class that will go out here very soon based on what you what we were just talking about earlier. Right. Do you care to share a little bit of the sure. outline that when we started looking together at the classes that, that you have offered and the idea of the art of living from the heart or what is a heart leader, I'm going to look at it differently than you looked at it and, and, and that Austin looked at it and other people because we have a different perspective. And I always like to go back to the real basics of anything when you start just to make sure that everybody is got their feet underneath them. And so the class I'm working on is how to manage your energy in your own best interest, whether you're a two-year-old or a parent or in a relationship or in a business, because right now we all feel it, that things are, are tough on everybody. And we're so quick to anger or so quick to, to lash out at people and even more so unhappy with ourselves and, the whole weight of the world is is on a lot of people right now. And so it's the simplest way possible to understand that if you don't manage your emotions, your emotions are going to manage you. And lots of people don't know a lot about their emotions, and they also don't believe that they're that powerful or that they have some control over it. So in the simplest way possible, if you begin to understand that your emotions are the plate and when you understand that you can manage them by learning strategies and you understand how they affect um, all the decisions that you make and what actually ends up in your, your life, um, I think that's a pretty place to start with anything. So I'm hopefully going to put something together that people who know a little bit might learn a little bit more and people that need to be reminded of it or have never understood the power of managing your own emotional energy. Um, start that off so we're all firmly planted in in the choice that we have in managing ourselves i can't wait to actually get it out there well you already know a lot about it but i know a lot about it and every day that i read something about it i think well that's just another little piece you know yay now i know a little bit more boy i forgot about that um good point yeah and ultimately as you said it doesn't matter how much you know about it right it's like the working out your core muscles, right? It's Excellent necessary way. to keep doing it mm -hmm. because the moment you stop is when those core muscles go, exactly. and there we are again. I've been working you know. with somebody else on a, a physical alignment and the whole idea that once we give up on working on our core, a physical alignment, things start to go by the wayside. And then you start working on your emotional alignment. Things really go out of the way. And sometimes you think that I just say that 
you know, or, or what happened to that nice person you used to be? You know, you, you realize it's an active daily process, but if you don't understand how valuable it is, you, you don't go back to say, wow, I seem to be, you know, not very happy these days and very critical and unkind to people. Maybe I need to go back and do some managing my own energy. Go back to your own personal library or all the classes that maybe you signed up for in the past if you can remember how to get into them and just revisit it. So let's see if we can make this one as um, valuable enough that people will go back and look at it because it then would have so many more offshoots, parenting or in leadership or in getting along in relationships or handling mind over matter with health and well-being. If you understand the basic core, it's easier to go forward in other aspects. Now I'm excited to go finish getting this done. Yeah, because it is one of those things. And we should be looking at our energetic okay. workout as much. That's why last month we talked about the compassion being calisthenics, right? Because exactly. we don't necessarily think about working out our emotions and working out our energetic form but it's a body whether we think about it being a body or not and so it is important to have these foundational things crunches are a staple if you're going to work out your abs you're going to do some sort of sit up it doesn't matter right you can make it as inventive as you want going side to side if you if you want okay. that but it's just a different take on the same thing. And here we all are with so many things happening right now. And it's so easy to have lowered our energy level. You know, you just kind of think, well, I'm just going to sit here all day. Or I don't feel like going out and doing anything. Or um, I can work at home now so I don't have to do stuff. Or everything's on my computer. And to me, that we've become pretty lethargic in a lot of areas of our life. And I can't imagine anything worse than to just sit around mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically all day long and not actively participate in life. And so um, with emotional intelligence or with relationships, you usually wait till you have a problem before you address it. And all of a sudden you have a personal crisis or crisis with your family or something. And then you realize you haven't been doing those crunches. You're not prepared. You don't know how to go in and handle um the situations that maybe you could handle before, or maybe a new one comes along and you think, I just, I don't remember how to do this. Or did anybody ever tell me what I'm supposed to do when I have a, a teenager or, or, uh, you know, my relationships fall apart. Where, where is the, where's the information? Where's, where's the rules? And, um, we've gotten a lot of lethargic and a lot of things in our world right now. So we need to, to do the crunches that we need to make ourselves be better able to manage whatever's coming next. And I think COVID, as challenging as it's been, you know, and we're getting back on our feet from that, there are other things going on in the world. Okay. But that in itself was a real eye opener for being prepared for the unexpected, right? Because nobody was anticipating being shut in the way that the entire world got shut in. Nobody was anticipating. We the, have that on our list of things to do before we died, right? Yeah, that's not on a bucket list right. anywhere, nor is the financial impact that right. resulted from that and the number of people who lost their personal businesses or all of the other hardships. There's no rule book written right. for how to engage in a world where that's happened. But there is a way to be centered enough in yourself to be able to handle anything that comes at you. And that's up where you're using the word centered, which which I think some people, you know, they they don't see it as an every an ever in all aspect. But whether we're centered and we're aligned, um, then we have a chance to spread outward, balanced. And what COVID's done to a lot of people and, and everything else is how resilient am I to keep being able to manage my energy and my best interest and keep going forward and keep rethinking that I'm in control of everything I can be in control of so I can respond to the things that are going to happen. 
And then that's where creativity comes in, which is part of what we're talking about today is when you're centered or balanced or aligned and you're resilient, you know that you can keep moving forward. Then you can tap into this well of creativity is how do I handle this in, in a way that, that will work? And then, then we're alive again. And that's where the lethargy ends. Lethargy. Lethargy. Mm -hmm. you, you've, you've centered yourself in where you're at. You feel that you can handle things. Your emotions are under control. Now, how do I make it fun? How do I make it work? How do I make it um, in everybody's best interest and in handling things in a way that life isn't just just the same repetitive, dull fear that a lot of people are, are living in right now. Just dumbed down fear of what next and who am I and what's going to happen to me. So, Well, speaking of being shut in and to just transition a little bit away from all the amazing things that we have kind of flowing now that mm -hmm. you're taking the helm, you're home. I want to talk about your home, which is this creative masterpiece from what I've come to understand. You have this creative little hotbed that you've generated. Since we are talking about creativity, what prompted you to have this amazing creative, like just surrounded in all of this awesome creativity all around you. What does that do for you? Well, you haven't seen my house except the little snippets of the pictures. You know, I like can how in Zoom something you go sit where something's really nice, but it is kind of the, the general topic that we're talking about is when life comes at you fast and you lose the things you care about the most and you have to start over again, which many of us have done many times and are doing right now, the idea of finding a safe place, work on yourself, but put beautiful things around you so that you, you can spark that light inside you. And my house is kind of funny. I just have a weird old house that I got for not by thinking, you know, it wasn't like I actively went out and shopped for the perfect house, which I didn't do at all. But I ended up with, you know, a minimal amount of money in a kind of a strange place without the things that I thought mattered the most. And I just started collecting stuff that made me happy because I find happy being a really important thing. And um, I live out in Carefree where there's a lot of thrift shops and recycle things because a lot of people leave you know they leave their things so for a very minimal amount of money you can buy kind of cool stuff and then the few people I knew would buy cool stuff and then they it would make them feel uncomfortable and so they'd give it to me so over a period of time I collected all sorts of unusual things that made me really happy and my idea of creativity is come up with a different way of looking at things. I don't ha know how to create a masterpiece or, or write a symphony, but I do know how to take something that used to be a vase and maybe turn it into something else or something that, that um, somebody might have used for a logical purpose and turn it into something crazy because those things make me happy. They make me happy to have beautiful things around me that didn't cost a lot of money and that if they break, I'm not going to feel bad about or you put them out in the sun for a while and then if they're not awesome, they're out of here, you know, and you try to move things around. So I do have kind of a creative space that makes me smile and I'm all for anything that makes me smile these days. So I like color. I like to reuse things. I like to redo things. I like everything to not end up in the garbage can if it doesn't have to. So there's got to be another thing you could do with those broken dishes because mosaics aren't that hard, you know, or when you're with food, when you're almost done with this food, why not create a fabulous goulash or something? I like every little um life force, everything that's that's in the world to be cared about. And so I keep moving things around so it becomes something else or or reusing it in a different way or painting it a different color so that when you you walk through a space if you're the kind of person that likes clean white lines you won't be happy there but if you're somebody that likes to sit in a chair and think what is that and that makes a conversation a creative conversation and come to my house so That's awesome and i know in your fireplace you actually have Hearts. I do. I collect hearts. And that's what's fun. It's kind of when we first met, 
I, I was working in a project and I decided my name was a hardest, a hardest, because I, I have such a heart for artists and artistic things, but I'm not an artist myself and in essence. So I'm just a wannabe artist. So I call myself a hardest. So I started looking at how many things I had that were already in the shape of hearts and people would give me things in the shape of hearts. And so that's kind of my thing. So there's hearts hidden all over my house that when you find them, that just kind of, again, makes you feel good about being alive. So heart leader through and through. Yeah, which just, it was a good match, I tell you. Yeah, you were just attracting it before you ever yeah. knew it. That's true. Yeah, and that's just, so when you saw the term heart leader uh -huh. and you came into this organization, before you saw our definition of what we felt a heart leader was, what does that invoke in you? Like, what does being a heart leader represent for you? I just find that that's such a wonderful question because how many people get asked that? You know, is like, um, I would not see myself as a leader at all, at, at, at all. I'm a co, I'm a she wolf. That's what I always say. <laughs> I always can find somebody that wants to do something and just helping them in any way they want to be helped is something that is who I am and what I want to do. And you look at leadership and the leadership classes I've taken or the people I w have worked for in many different capacities. And you just think, wow, where along the line did you miss how to motivate me? Where along the line did you think that that's the way that would make this organization better or these students better students or um, the world a better place? Because you're wrong. Fear and punishment work. but domination, criticism, fear, and punishment don't have the long range effect that we want in the world. So I always think as a heart leader who has a passion, once you just see somebody whose heart, you can just feel their heart beating, their passion is so important to them. And they want to embrace people with their idea, as well as draw them in, in to, to the, to the light, to the light. So when I always think of it, it's somebody that really knows what they want and they want you to feel a part of their dream and so I look at the people that you're working with and the things you want to teach and think how many people out there are creative force are somebody to be reckoned with from the good that want to include as many other people that want to be part of the same mission but don't want to lead it want to be um, inclusive with it and so I think a heart leader just their their own inner light is so strong that they want to draw people in not out of fear but out of passion that is brilliant well I'm hoping that you're attracting a lot of people because the people that you have seem to really feel that way that they they that they they want to lead from the heart, and maybe the the way that we've been led in the past, and any kind of a leader, it was not that way. It was not the way that you actually, as you said when we started this conversation, the brain down is not how we learn. It's the heart open is how we learn. And when you tapped into somebody's heart, then you get you get what you're trying to get in the first place. You get the brain engaged. You get the emotions in line. You get the power of being a human spirit going. So yeah. let's do it as many people as you can. I, yes, let's, that's why we call this a movement, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not about any one mm -hmm. of us. We are just, it's a bunch of heart leaders coming together, each one stepping into the leadership role that their skill set is most aligned for. But it's like you are so well equipped to lead our education center. I don't have that skill set. I know enough to be dangerous. Mm -hmm. But now that you are here, I'm going to share the insights that I have. But I trust you implicitly. You are the leader in this segment because you have such passion, such drive, such knowing that you then take to embodying because it is your purpose to share that information, that insight, that all that you've gained and help individuals walk that or share 
what they're coming to learn from our organization. I don't need to lead everything. But you, what you do so well is, is the concept of a team that's actually willing to listen to each other that takes curiosity and creativity and said, well, I don't think I agree with anything that they say, or maybe I need to step back and come up with a different approach, or I think I know everything, but that person might have something to say and let go of your own preconceived ideas about anything and be curious to be creative and see how we can move forward with it because a leader doesn't have any power to make things change except fear unless they have a team that really backs them with 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 matching skills as well as um, the compassion and the empathy of how difficult it is to get any project together but the connection is amazing and and I'm looking at the connection that we can have here with people that already know what they're doing but are happy to just make it better happy to add a new point of view happy to put some ideas into the table or into a program and then listen to your students listen to your clients as well and then keep changing it and say well that's even better well that looks great because nobody is so committed to having their own um, voice heard that they're willing to just kind of listen to other people's voices and make it a team effort which is what is going to make our organization a really valuable one listening to the people that the want to learn and say, well, didn't think about that. How interesting. Because at the end of the day, that's why we're here. Right. right. Isn't that why we're here on everything? We're not just supposed to be marching along, just doing what we want to do and, and you know, leaving a, a, a reign of, of chaos behind us. You want to somehow make a big difference with your ideas and your energy with other people that 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 wanted to be on the same pathway and maybe we're not ready to get on it by themselves or we're just waiting for you and then there you go i love you lady and i'm so grateful you're here with us it's just such an odd sets of circumstances for me that i'm just amazed so well, we'll see where we're going spirit will always bring us together how good and thank you so much for joining us here on the Heart Leader Podcast, where heart and mind align. The lovely Linda Levitt taking over our educational curriculum program. So happy to be able to introduce her to the community. She helped us build out the resource that's available in the Heart Leader Toolbox the creativity workbook so don't forget to hop on over and make sure you download that free tool it is available right now so if you look on the link below this video you'll be able to get to that free resource until next time we look forward to seeing you in the heart leader and suivera community You've been listening to the Heart Leader Podcast with your host, Amber, where heart and mind align. Tune in weekly as we take a deeper dive into what it means to be a heart leader. Ready to take the next step? Join us and over 1 million people worldwide who've united in creating this global movement of love. Become a heart leader for today and tomorrow. Learn more and connect with us at Suibera.org.